Hi, and welcome to the UW-Madison Division of Extension Lifespan Program's Wise Wednesday Spring Series. I'm Sarah Ritchie, the Lifespan Outreach Program Manager. Thank you for joining us today. Today's session is about compassion. I'll hand it off to Heather to formally introduce herself. Thank you, Sarah, and welcome everyone. My name is Heather Quackenboss. I am in La Crosse County. Very happy to be doing the spring series on compassion and what we can do to perhaps have more compassion for others as well as how to have some more compassion for ourselves. So the first thing I'd like you to think of today is what is something you are proud of yourself from today or this week? And it might be something very, very small, like, hey, I walked for five minutes outside today. It might be, I got out of bed today. It might be, I finished a huge project. All of these things are important because when we start our learning with something positive, we actually absorb more information. So if you wanna take a second to think of what you're proud of, and kind of feel how that feels, take that right now. Now this next slide is not an infinite list because I can't fit everything on here. But what I do have are some values. And what I'd like you to think of right now is what if I asked you to describe yourself with one core value, what would that value be? And you might ask Heather, how am I supposed to think of one? I will let you fudge a little bit saying, well, okay, I might say, you know, this one and this one and this one, but all three could maybe be summed up in this value. So think about that for a, a moment. And in all honesty, what I tend to do, I really value connection, authenticity, and belonging. And when I look at those three for myself, I'm thinking, well, what is that bigger picture that I have for that? And honestly, folks, my core value is frankly connection. And Sarah, if you'd like to share what might your one core value be, as I put one person on the spot here, um, well, I, family comes to mind, but I also really value connection and I think family, even, and friends and people that are close to me and just that being social probably can all fit under connection. Yeah, sure, sure does. Now, just in case I'm making all of you think of connection, think about what those very, very important things in your life are. That might be family or faith or loyalty. That might be achievement or teamwork or usefulness or independence or equity or forgiveness. What is that thing that you really lead your life through? Now it's nice to have a word. It's also important to know what living your value looks like in everyday life. So in all honesty, for me with connection, it's connecting to whoever I'm with at the time. So when I get home from work or this past year, when I close my computer and I'm done with work, my intention is to really connect with the people in my house, my family. Now to do that sometimes, what does that really look like? It means turning off my computer before I close it. Because if it dings, I might want to go over and check that. And for me to connect with my family, I need to shut that other stuff off. For me, if my, if my value was family, maybe to really spend time with the family, maybe what that looks like is to have dinner with my family as much as possible. Or maybe dinner doesn't work, so it's breakfast. Or maybe that doesn't work, so it's a snack at some point in the day. So you get to decide, all right, to live the value that I have, what does it actually look like in that mundane, everyday kind of way? And why our values are important is because they also give us the lens in which we look at the world with, gives us our perception. This is one of my favorite cartoon pictures, this lovely rhinoceros painting these beautiful landscapes of their home and of where they are. And in every single picture that the rhinoceros paints, there are horns in it. And that rhinoceros horn, they don't know that no one else sees that. 
This is how they view the world. We all have that rhinoceros horn. It might be our value, which can be very positive, and sometimes can make us think, hey, why are you thinking that way? Because that's not my value. Why would you like this? So sometimes when our values are different and we have those different lenses, we can almost disconnect from folks. And when we start disconnecting and maybe not having that empathy and trying to avoid different things, that's when we find some challenging times and where we might not have that much compassion. How do we start rolling back toward compassion or how do we have some of that? I like to play a game called Just Like Me. I'd like you to think of something that just irritates you. I'd like you to think of something that you just wish people would just stop doing or start doing. For, for me, oftentimes this, this comes in when I'm driving. And when I'm driving down the road and somebody flies by me so super fast, my first thought, frankly, is, oh my gosh, you're going to hurt somebody. You're so dangerous. If I start thinking in that just like me mentality, how is that person who just sped by me just like me? So maybe that person is late picking up their family, just like I am sometimes. Maybe that person is having an emergency, just like I sometimes have. Now, the converse is true as well. If someone's really, really going slowly in front of me, oh, come on, why aren't you driving faster? What's wrong with you? Don't you need to know I need to get someplace? So if I reframe and think, oh, how is this just like me? Sometimes there's roads I'm a little nervous on, just like maybe this person is. Or maybe this person's looking for a house, an address and trying to see the house numbers, which honestly, sometimes I also can't see on the houses very well. So when we do the just like me, even with those things that irritate us the most, we form a little more connection and maybe a little more empathy. And even though we don't necessarily know that person's story, we can find that, oh, maybe sometimes I do this too. And we then have that connection, even if that person's never going to know it. The thing is, compassion often takes a lot of vulnerability, authenticity, and grace. To really connect with folks and to really get some understanding, we might need to be vulnerable and say those things that we don't tend to share with many people. And if you don't share with many people, that's okay. To be able to have one person in our lives to really be authentic and honest and real with and not have that judgment, have them understand is beautiful. And to be that person who's, you know, accepting a vulnerability and does not judge and listens authentically is a lovely thing too. Now, the thing is we often don't give ourselves or others the grace to do that. A lot of times that apple in the mirror in the picture shows that bright, shiny, beautiful side of the apple. And that, we see this on social media, that is what we want people to see. We edit our lives so others see it. Other people edit their lives so everyone thinks everything's golden and rosy and a bright shiny apple. And frankly, none of us are gonna look as beautiful as that apple in the mirror. Many of us have bruises and bites out of us in the apple, of course, if we're using the metaphor, right? And to be able to show that to someone else really helps that compassion. And when we look at that compassion and that empathy, it's not necessarily knowing how to fix something, it's being able to sit with that person and say, whoa, yeah, I don't know what to say maybe. I'm glad you told me. So knowing that, maybe even saying that for ourselves too, is whew, I'm going through this and I'm not even sure how I'm gonna get through it, and maybe I can get some help or figure this out. Because folks, all of us have a story. All of us have a history. And in our lives, we have been maybe hurt, maybe wounded in some way. We might 
you know, have had stories that we have had amazing resilience in getting through to make us who we are today. And uh, some of these traumas are intergenerational. They pass from generation to generation. So knowing that we have a history, knowing that everyone around us has a history can help us to realize, you know what, we're more alike than we are different. Because again, it's going to be a lot of our perspective. If we're on an island in the middle of the ocean, we're probably only looking for a boat to come rescue us. And if we're on that boat in the middle of the ocean, we might only be looking for land. So our perspectives are very different. And when we come together, we might need to look at and discuss, all right, how are we gonna make this work now? Oh, sounds easy, right? How do we do this? Honestly, so we're gonna start with a word that maybe makes us all a little bit itchy, and that word's feelings. Acknowledging and recognizing our feelings can really help us when we are trying to be compassionate and graceful with ourselves and when we're trying to show others compassion. For instance, if I'm feeling really sad, I'm, you know, and, and I acknowledge that sadness, I can then think of, all right, that sadness is telling me something. I can deal with sadness. Otherwise, maybe I'm just overwhelmed and so many things are happening and my head might be spinning and I'm just not quite sure what to do. Feelings can help us figure out what we might need. So honestly, if I'm sad, if my morning has just not gone the right way and my family is not doing so well and everyone's angry with each other and I'm just feeling maybe a little bit bad because as that parent, I sometimes think I need to help that move and go and work. So maybe I need to feel like everyone belongs. Maybe I need to feel like what I do matters. Maybe I need to you know, have a little bit of nurturing myself. So what kind of goes along with that sadness? Once I recognize and acknowledge that sadness and say, oof, wow, this is just so sad, then I can maybe sit with it, maybe cry for a while, maybe play some music, do whatever my coping skill of choice is, and then start working on that. If we're angry, because that's one of those feelings that sometimes is okay to have, right? And sometimes can get a little scary. Frankly, when we're angry, something's not right. So what is it that we need to fight for? What is it that's, that's not you know, going so well in our lives? To sit with that anger is good. I used to send my son out when he got angry. He was not calming down at all. And from the time he was about two, I would send him outside and have him swing. He needed to get his anger out. And when swings, he was too old for swings, it was the trampoline. It was get that anger out. So acknowledging, hey, you are so angry right now and calming down is not gonna happen. Swing it out, jump it out, something it out, right? So acknowledging the feeling, getting it out or sitting with it, and then, all right, what is it I'm missing? What is it that I need? So for all of you that are like, ugh, Heather, feelings are a little squishy. Feelings are also data points for what we need. So if we're angry, do we need some more balance in our life? Do we need some autonomy? Hey, everyone, leave me alone. Let me make a decision, right? Do we need a little comfort? You know, maybe we need someone to say, you know what? I don't know how to help, and I think it's going to be okay. Sometimes we need that. Now then again, sometimes if we just jump to thinking we know what the person needs, that might be the last thing they wanna hear. And then we're like, I'm sorry, I intended this and I was wrong. And then you can go back, you're feeling angry, how can I help you? So we can always do that. Here's the thing that happens so often. Here's our communication style, the world as most of us know it. We see something. We observe something that happens, we interpret it right away. Kind of like me driving, somebody's too fast, I interpret they must be dangerous. 
someone's going too slow, they obviously shouldn't drive, right? I make that judgment as soon as I interpret something. Now, when I interpret something and make a judgment, I have absolutely no connection. I'm not doing, how's that person just like me, right? And then what could happen is I strategize, all right, what am I gonna do about this? And then if I ever, I'm probably not gonna see that person on the road again. However, if I'm in person with someone and I strategize, I might make demand. Let's just take the situation of the dishwasher. We have this beautiful dishwasher at home and honestly, I didn't have a dishwasher until the house I live in now. When we were kids, we washed all the dishes by hand. When I you know, was in college, it was dishes by hand. When I was first married, it was dishes by hand. So a dishwasher is amazing. Nobody ever unloads the dishwasher in my house. There, it's almost like laundry. The laundry gets clean and there it sits in the basket, right? So I have some things to work on sometimes too. And every day that dishwasher gets filled up, it gets cleaned and man, I come in and I interpret dishwashers and there is full again of clean dishes. I make a judgment, you know, the people who are supposed to unload it may be being lazy. I strategize and probably it's not the best strategy and I then make a demand, hey, get the dishwasher unloaded. Here's where we could change things up in a more compassionate way. And this is called nonviolent communication. So that's the NBC. And nonviolent communication language and communication still takes the observation. What do you see? What do you hear? And that's all kind of scientific here. What are those things you can see, feel, hear? And then honestly, we have a feeling about it, don't we? So if I'm driving and someone's going fast, I might get a little scared, a little panicky, a little worried. So my need, if I'm scared, panicky, or worried, is whew, I just need to know that I'm gonna be safe. When it's the dishwasher, I observe the dishwashers there. Oh, they didn't unload the dishwasher when they were, that was their job today. My feeling might be a little overwhelmed. My feeling might be frustrated. And when I'm overwhelmed or frustrated, I need some help. I need some support. I need to know that you, you do what I ask you. Now, I also here can think about what is that other people person? What do the other people or what do the other, well, other person, what do they think about this? Well, how, they, how do they feel about this? And you know, maybe, maybe my son needed to unload the dishes and he gets home from school and has you know, a boatload of homework. Maybe he's feeling a little overwhelmed. And maybe what he needs is some more support or a little more time or to get homework done first and then come here. So when I start looking at where might he be feeling and what he might be needing, that's when we can have a talk or a discussion or maybe a dialogue and say, hey, you know, I asked you to unload the dishwasher this morning, you haven't done it. Are you okay? Do you have some stuff going on? How can I help you? Sounds a lot different than go in there and unload the dishwasher. And then he has the opportunity to say, I have all of this homework, I'm a little overwhelmed, I just need some time. I can do it in an hour. That's when we start to actually have, have things happen. So same thing, you want the dishwasher unloaded, right? Two very different ways of doing it. One fosters a little more connection, a little more understanding, a little more support. The other, it'll still get done and we don't have that compassion there. Now, here's the thing though. When we are a caregiver or when we help others, when we try to do things compassionately, we can end up on this lovely compassion fatigues path. Now this is some beautiful information out of Rogers Behavioral Health, and they have some compassion resilience toolkits, which extension will be training in in the future. On this wheel, when we start anything, we start caregiving for someone, we start a new project, we start helping a friend, we are committed, we're involved, we're almost a zealot. I'm going to change everything and everything's going to be beautiful because of me. Sometimes that's gonna to lead to some irritability. 
We're gonna become like Grumpy Cat there, and we're gonna get angry. We're not gonna be as creative. We might have feelings of helplessness or hopelessness. We're just kind of irritated about having to do this every day. And if we look at our past year during a pandemic, and if we've been living with just our family members, you might understand how this happens and how they might be across the room eating crackers. And my gosh, how dare they eat crackers? We could then get to withdrawal. We get overwhelmed by complexity. We are exhausted all the time. We might get sick physically or mentally. We might have difficulty empathizing with the folks we're working with. We might have some absenteeism where we're there physically, but our mind, our spirits just elsewhere. And you can kind of see how this happens when you do the same tasks day in and day out. It almost becomes mindless and you get done with something and you don't realize you've done it, that can be that withdrawal. Then you go over to the zombie cat where you have a sense that you can never do enough. You kind of inflate your self sense of importance. You might not be sleeping. You have a sense of persecution. You might have a lot of guilt and you just become this almost a shell and you're not quite sure, okay, what's going on? How do I get out of this? It's almost this never ending cycle. This then can lead us to whether we continue and find some compassion resilience where we're like, okay, how do I take this break? How do I do this? How do I maybe ask for help? And it also might end up where you either leave the profession if you're in a helping profession. You might not caregive the person you're caregiving any longer and you decide here's what I can do and what I can't do. It might be stopping doing what you're doing and helping a friend. It might be creating some different boundaries so that you have a little bit of resilience and you don't end up doing the same exact thing you were. This cycle is important because when we're compassionate and when we're working on compassion, we have a lot of guilt when we're not in that zealot cat phase. And when we're not in that zealot phase and we're irritable and we withdraw and we're kind of zombie-like, we have a lot of guilt. And honestly, I wanna tell you all, this is normal. All of these feelings, all of these things are going to happen to us as we work with others. So how then do we start doing some of this and practicing some of this? The first thing is, is that leaning in. And leaning in is, all right, almost taking those feelings, trying to understand what someone else's needs are, and to really authentically listen. Now, this comes from Racial Justice from the Heart by Dr. Amanda Kemp. And what it really looks at is, do you have the capacity to do this? And how do you lean in where you really listen? And listening is one of the key things here. Folks want to know that they are heard. So we often listen to respond, and this is more listening to understand. So, hey, how do you feel about this? Tell me more about this. What does this mean to you? Those questions, that's the leaning in, is to, all right, what is their story? What is their perspective, their lens? What's their rhinoceros horn? Because once we understand their rhinoceros horn, and we know what our rhinoceros horn is, then we can start connecting. Because often when we look at things with feelings or values, we can find something common. And when we have something common to talk about, even if we're on very different sides of an issue, then we can have a discussion where both of us agree on something. And that can really help those tough, tough discussions. So, Another thing that really kind of stops us, and this is one of my favorite pictures too, apparently cartoon animals and I get along really well. We all have a comfort zone, which is where that beautiful donkey is. And our comfort zone, we feel safe, we feel in control, and we are good. Anytime we learn something new, anytime someone asks a question where we're uncomfortable, anytime maybe conflict comes up, we go right into that fear zone first zone out of our comfort zone is fear. Why would we leave the comfort zone? So fear zone, we don't have the self-confidence. We find excuses to not do it. And if you ever think of 
when you've tried exercising for the first time in a long time, you go right to that fear zone because all of those excuses, oh, I don't have the right clothes. I don't have the right shoes. I didn't wake up you know, early enough. The weather is not quite perfect. We find any excuse we can. Same thing with everything in the fear zone. And we get affected by other people's opinions a lot. Now that fear zone, honestly, a lot of us run right back to the comfort zone. Whoop, nope, uncomfortable, back, back here. When we get through the fear zone though, we get to the learning zone. And this is where we're dealing with challenges and problems. We're acquiring new skills. We're extending our comfort zone. Anytime we learn something new and we're in that learning zone, our comfort zone gets bigger and the fear zone gets smaller. Now, the lovely rainbow unicorn over there is the growth zone. And one of the reasons that's a unicorn is it's, the growth zone's pretty rare. This is where we found our purpose, where we're living our dreams, we're setting new goals. Our comfort zone is hugely expanded in whatever area that we were working with. And it's, it's lovely. And when you find that growth zone, you just, everything comes together. We're not always going to get there. Quick example of this is I play the piano all right. I'm not amazing. And so I have a comfort zone of here's the songs I can play and that I could sit down and feel okay playing for people who come over. My kids are musicians. And so they play in state solo or not state solo ensemble. They play in solo ensemble most years. And they bring me their music so I can accompany them, which I love to do because it brings connection, right? And I jump right into that fear zone as soon as I look at the music because folks, sometimes accompaniment is so hard. And I stay in that fear zone for a while and then I start thinking, well, I'm the accompaniment. I need to make my child sound good. They're not judging me. And I don't have to sound like all of the recordings that I'm listening to. So my fear zone lasts for a little while, and then I start getting into the learning zone. And does that automatically make me sound better on the piano? No, my family suffers for weeks listening to me trying to learn this. But I figure out which notes could I skip and what could I modify here and how could I play this piece a little bit easier right here. I get to that learning zone. Do I ever, in accompaniment, get to that growth zone? I can tell you legitimately, no, I have never been there during accompaniment. Do I get good enough where I feel okay accompanying my kids? Yes. Still nervous, still in the learning zone, comfort zone's a little extended. The other thing that we need to look at is what we are willing to do. So often, we give and give and give enough of ourselves. And that's where we get on that compassion fatigue cycle, that irritability, that withdrawal. Having some healthy boundaries is going to be important. And this is also why I had asked you to look at your value. Because when you value different things, you can say, okay, this is what I wanna make sure I do. And this is what I might wanna say no to. So knowing what you are willing to do is going to be important. Knowing what you're willing not to do is also very important. So if you are caregiving, for example, you know, where is that point where you're going to think, oh, I'm going to need help here? When you are having hard discussions about the future or about what's going on or plans, all right, where might I be willing to compromise? Where do I really want to stick to my value or my plan or my idea? So what are you are willing to do is going to be important here. And then honestly, all of the things happen all of the days, right? We have things that come up. We have phone calls and emails and somebody asking this. When you are looking at your day, our day is kind of like that bucket on the bottom, right? And in our bucket goes all of the stuff that has to happen, that goes all of the stuff that just comes up, and there come, there's the stuff that there's nothing we can do about. So I'd like you to think about, and if you want to pause this after I explain it and, and take some time to write things down and make your own list, please do that. With all of the things in our day, in our life, on our task list, in our head of what we think we need to do, 
On the left, there's what I can control. On the right, what I cannot control. Big example of what I cannot control is that weather. You know, I today in as we're recording this, it's kind of gray, it's kind of cold. And and I know, I know some people across the state woke up to snow. So you can't control that. I can control my reaction to it. I can control going to the closet and getting the winter coat back out and saying, I don't care, I don't want to be cold. So when you look at the things that you can and cannot control, sometimes there's aspects of each thing that go on each list. What I can control is my response to things. However, sometimes I can't control the reaction. That reaction, our reaction brain happens faster than our response brain. So sometimes we catch ourselves there. What I can control is what I say. What I can't control are what my family says. All of these things, just knowing them in my head can really help. So in your life, in your day, on your task list, what can you control? What can't you control? And then we get to frame those things, right? And when we frame any situation, we can put any frame around any picture we want to put. If I put a black frame around a picture, it's going to give it a very different look than if I put a red frame around a picture. So how we frame things is important. The other challenge I have for you is to take the word but out of your vocabulary. We are a culture who loves buts. I love you, but I wish you would replace the toilet paper. I love you, but you need to get your homework done. When I say the word but, it kind of negates anything I said before it. And what that person might have heard then is, oh, I didn't do this. And maybe if I do this, you know, mom or, or the person I love will, will like me better. If I replace it with and, I love you, and I need you to replace the toilet paper roll, both of those statements are true. Like, all right, she loves me, and I, I need to do my job. I love you, and I need you to get your homework done. Sounds a little more supportive. Sounds a little bit more like, ooh, I could ask her for some help. I could maybe, you know, I, I can feel that compassion there, and I know that I'll have some support. So going back to that value then that you had, and maybe you've changed your mind. You're like, oh, wow, working through this, maybe my value is more courage than, than usefulness, or maybe my value is more diversity than peace. You can, it's okay to change that. What fits you might look a little bit different from different time to time. Or maybe you're kind of taking a word and stewing it down and saying, okay, here it is, here's this word. So of the values that you have. Let's look at then, what are those things we wanna say yes to? And what are those things that we wanna say no to? And Sarah, I'm going to ask you in a second here about your value after I explain it a little bit so you have a couple seconds here. So if my value is connection, or let's say, let's say my value is authenticity because that one's a little bit harder and a lot of compassion goes with authenticity is, okay, what I wanna say yes to is really listening to someone's story so I can understand it. What I might need to learn better, how to say no or what to say no to is judging that right away or trying to find a different intent to their story or trying to fix something right away. If I'm talking to my daughter, and she's giving me a story that happened in her life. If I try to fix it first, she's going to stop telling me her story. She's like, whatever, never mind. So in that situation, to be authentic, what I'm going to say yes to is to zip my lip and listen. And what I'm going to say no to is offering any solutions first. I might even say yes to, do you want me to listen? so you can, can get this out to, to vent? Do you want me to help you find any solutions? Because then I know which brain I wanna to go to as well. So Sarah, you were talking about family and connection. What are things you might say yes to? And what are things you might say no to? 
um, things that I will say yes to, and I've been working really hard at being better at <laughs> this, um, is when my toddler wants me to play with him. We play, you know, imagine imaginary cars and we play pretend a lot. So um, that may be making time for a movie night or doing something special together um, and things I will say no to. I'm guessing that's where you're going to go next. <laughs> yes, it is. Um, the dishes that pile up next to the sink, those can wait until after he goes to bed. So um, making those types of changes, I think. Yeah, yeah, thank you for that. And, and look at that priority, right? Mm -hmm. Is all right, here's what I want to say yes to. And toddlers have an earlier bedtime sometimes than, than others. Then they became teenagers and they stay up way later than you do when you just say good night. Mm -hmm. So what you say yes to now, will might maybe will change in the future. And then those dishes can wait for a while. And it also might be that boundary too, where you look at, okay, I want to say yes to my toddler and play cars. And here's what bedtime is. And here's that bedtime routine. So then the stuff that I said no to that I know still needs to happen, dishes, laundry, dinner, all those things still does happen. So where's that boundary? Sometimes that can be an important part of this. So for those of you watching, you can pause this and make your list. What would you say yes to, to really live your value? And what do you say no to? And what might be those things in the middle that, okay, these still have to happen, but here's how I might, oh, I said, but didn't I? And here's how I could do this as I move forward. So looking then at yourself, because sometimes it's easier to pick up on other people's feelings or to see situations differently when we're not in them. And so I'd like you to think of, how are you feeling right now? And really name it. I mean, there's cute bumper stickers out there that say things like, you got to name it to tame it, right? And when we have these feelings, or when the people in our life have these feelings, if we say, hey, wow, Sarah, are you a little overwhelmed right now? Then you're like, oh, yeah, Heather, you're right. Or you can say, no, Heather, I'm so frustrated. And so when we acknowledge that feeling with someone else, they know we saw them as a human. They know that they're seen and heard. When we do this with ourselves, it works too. When we name that feeling that we're having, it helps bring us back, maybe grounds us a little bit more, maybe centers us a little more, because that feeling we can sit with. Once we know it, oh, okay, I feel all better already. And then we can figure out what it is we might be needing. So think about yourself. And in those situations, maybe in that situation where, where you get a little bit irritated. When I feel irritated, I need what? Do you need someone to listen? Do you need someone to help offer solutions? Do you need, do you need a break? Do you need to feel safe? So think about those different feelings you have that pop up because feelings do that. They just pop up. What is it that you need? And then think about those people in your lives who maybe you want a little more compassion resilience with. Maybe you have some compassion fatigue because of. Maybe, you know, they're the person who's always there in your life. So think about how do they feel? And when they're feeling that way, what might they need? You're not always going to know, but when you have people in your life, sometimes you start picking that up and you can also ask them, hey, when you're feeling this angry, what is it that you need that I can support you in? So for my son, it was when you feel angry, I know he needs some physical activity. Now it looked very different maybe, for my husband, when you feel angry, you need someone to listen. So it might be very different. When we know how we feel and what we need and what other people feel and what they need, we can ask for help, we can request something different, or we can say, woof, this is my boundary, I need to say no. Now, my sister sent me this picture. I like to bake, and she said, Heather, this pie would be so neat if you made this. It's cute. It's this 
weird looking octopus pie crust. And honestly, I tried to make a pie last night and I tried to cut a couple stars out and my cookie cutters were way up in the cupboard and I really didn't feel like getting them. So I tried to freehand it. My stars don't look very good, ladies and gentlemen. So honestly, if I were really to try this octopus pie, I'm probably going to end up on a page of nailed it. And my pie's not gonna look as good as the one that my, pic my sister found somewhere on the internet. When we look at working on compassion, when we look at becoming more compassionate or trying to make more of a connection or being more empathetic, we're going to end up nailing it or failing it sometimes. And honestly, that is okay because we always get another chance. Sometimes that intention causes an impact that was maybe hurtful or harmful. In that case, we can apologize. In that case, we can thank someone else for their grace. And we can work on trying to make that perfect octopus pie again. So I want to thank you today for listening to, to Compassion. We, I know there might be things that are still circling in your mind. And my email address is right there on the last screen. And I want to thank you for listening. Have a beautiful day.